Great, well, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, forum debate on money and influence. I'm Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University, and I'm delighted that we have with us here to debate the issues that come out of money and politics. We have TJ Stiles, author and historian, here on my right. We have Anthony Scaramucci, who is the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital. And here on my left, Kenneth Rogoff, who's a professor of public policy and economics at Harvard. And on my far left, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, professor at Columbia University. So the first thing I'd like to do before we even engage in the, in the elements of this debate is get you to have a little vote on whether you actually think that, and I think the question should come up in a second, but the question is, is democracy being corroded by wealthy individuals and corporations? So you've got a little machine next to you, and you can press, I think it's one for yes and two for no. So you can press it as soon as the little green bar comes up. They can vote now. Where you go, have a, have a quick vote. Is democracy being corroded by wealthy individuals and corporations? The United States survey. <laughs> okay, so that's a really interesting result. 64% are saying yes and nearly 36% are saying no. And just to contrast that with the Facebook community that have replied before they've come, 134 thought yes and 11 thought no. <laughs> so we're better placed to have a robust debate about that today. <laughs> so before I turn to our panelists, let's just think for a minute about what we expect of a democracy. We expect a democracy first to be representative, so to represent all the classes, races, minorities, majorities in a population through the electoral process. We expect, secondly, we expect a democracy to constrain the rulers and require them to stick to the rule of law and protect minority rights. That's why we need independent courts and judges. And third, we expect in a democracy to help hold a government to account counterbalancing interest, interest groups. So yes, associations of companies, on the one hand, labor unions, associations of workers, other kinds of interest groups, counterbalancing one another. And finally, we expect a free and well-informed commentary, whether it's Twitter, blogs, newspapers, the media. These are things that hold a democracy honest and accountable. So the question we're looking at today is when inequality rises in a society, what happens to those four? Does, does a, really, a, a more unequal society mean that the wealthy can simply buy the representation that they want? Does it mean that they can buy top lawyers and always win in the courts? Does it mean that they can fund interest groups that pursue just their interests? Does it mean that they can buy the media, buy the television stations, buy the newspapers, and just control the debate through that means? Or is rising inequality creating a new plutocracy that is investing in all of these things and actually strengthening democracy by bringing more force to a plurality of debate in all those realms? That's what we're here to debate today. And I'd like to start by turning to Anthony Scaramucci, what do you think, Anthony? Do you think that it is possible that money politics is actually strengthening democracy? And, I, and I'd say, you know, today we will be focusing quite a lot of our panelists on America. That's where each of the panelists is working and commenting for the most part. But I'm going to be calling on you regularly. So I want you to really uh, prepare your comments to make sure that the debate also takes the points made by our panelists to the different parts of the world that you're from. So, Anthony. Well, you know, just to draw some of the historical context, in our, the founding of the nation, we've always had money involved in politics in one shape, way, or another. And so I, I can remember John F. Kennedy making the remark at a press conference when they said that your dad is going to buy the election, the 1960 presidency, and the, the president quipped that 
Yeah, he's going to certainly try to do that, but he's a tightwad. He's not going to pay for one more vote than I need. And it sort of softened the issue for uh, President Kennedy. Uh, his father said that he was going to sell him like soap flakes uh, to the, uh, the people of the United States. And if people remember the election in 1960, it was a very, very close race. Uh, I think he won only by 100,000 votes. Flash forward 50 years after the Citizens United Supreme Court case, I think the court has decided, at least the majority of the justices, that uh, the money can be an effective bullhorn for people. Now, it's my belief that uh, the entrepreneurs in our society, the political entrepreneurs, against that. There's no doubt that there is some cor corrosive effect, but sometimes when there is a corrosive effect, you get a reaction that is quite positive. And I think you see that in social media, you see that in Twitter. Um, and my prediction is, is that both sides, at least in our country, will figure out ways to raise enough capital for each other to get their ideas out. And just one last point, uh, the Republicans spent a billion plus dollars in a number of different elections and tons of PAC money was spent in the United States in 2012. And I will tell you, I think it was a very little effect on the overall election there. You, I mean, you had a, a very successful hedge fund. It's a flourishing sector in the United States. What's the most effective way that you inform and influence government policy in the United States to make sure that your sector flourishes? Well, you know, to, to be completely candid, I am less interested in the flourishing of my sector and more interested in the flourishing of the society because at the end of the day, if you're putting the people first, uh, good things happen in a society. And so um, my, my thing is, and I'll give my voting history so people can understand, I went to law school with President Obama. I bundled for President Obama, and I voted for President Obama. In the second season, um, I bundled for Governor Romney. Um, so I just want you to know that I'm an eclectic person. Um, I describe myself as uh, socially inclusive and fiscally responsible. See, notice I didn't use the word socially liberal and fiscally conservative because I believe that those are labels and possibly pejoratives. And so uh, what I've looked for is really in the person and in leadership. You know, I voted for President Clinton twice. And if uh, Mr. Clinton could run again in 2016, he would get my vote and certainly my support. So, so, so I'm yeah. really looking for the best people who are interested in serving the nation as opposed to themselves. So yesterday, Tom Friedman in a debate said, in the 1980s, the heads of big American corporations would go to Washington with well-prepared views on a whole range of issues, immigration, education, um, you know, the big issues facing the nation. What's happening today is that they fly in in their private jet, land it in Virginia, sneak in at 6 a.m., argue for the one amendment to a piece of legislation that directly affects their business, and go back and sneak back out before they're noticed and, and tweeted about. Does that ring true to you? Is that, is, is that what is Washington, this, this, this place where one simply goes to, to protect one's own interest? Or, or do you think you and your colleagues and, and other corporate heads in the United States are engaging in the public policy debate? I certainly think what you're saying is true. There's no question that there's an aspect of that. Um, I'm getting older now, so I'm trying to be less cynical. Um, I'm optimistic about uh, reaching people. I think one of the things that President Obama did in the 2008 campaign is that he built an entire new base in the Democratic Party. Uh, and his message was something that people embraced. And if people will remember uh, their political history, he was down 23% in the polls, and Mrs. Clinton was up $24 million in the fundraising. Uh, and he managed to figure out a way through great political entrepreneurship to change that. And you're right. Listen, we, we spend $5.5 billion in lobbying in the United States. And is there any reason why? There's a lot of uh, corporations that are feeding off the trow of our government. People sometimes call that crony capitalism. Um, I, I can only speak for myself and some of my friends that, in terms of the way we have tried to support things. You know, for myself, I'm, I'm committed to the uh, lesbian and gay marriage movement and lesbian equality. Uh, that rings totally against the uh, Republican Party, even though I'm a registered Republican. Okay. Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to now bring it to, sorry, but, to, to thank you. And I'm going to bring it to T.J. Styles. <clears throat> T.J. is a historian, and you've traced the role of money in politics. And I just wondered, do, is the role of big money in politics, has it changed in the last couple of decades? Well, yes, I think so. I, you know, in uh, a market economy such as in the United States and much of the world, 
the engine of growth and of prosperity is also the engine of inequality. And so there is an inherent danger that's wrapped up in our very success, and that is the corporation. So the corporation is something that has wielded enormous influence and power, and at times it has grown to great extremes in American history and then been constrained. Now, what is the balance against great, the accumulation of great wealth and of great power in these private, unelected, um, in a political sense, irresponsible, not, not morally, but not responsible to the electorate, irresponsible organizations? Um, it is uh, a strong cultural centers of criticism that we need to have. We need to have great wealth, and we need to have the critics of great wealth. And part of the reason is, is that um, no one exactly knows what regulations, what constraints um, are going to make sense 10 or 20 years from now. As I look at history, I see that the, the debate over the economy, uh, the way we even conceptualize things like the corporation, securities, um, equality, these things change. So the only way to find our way forward is, is um, a marketplace of ideas. We need robust criticism and competition. What concerns me about the present are two things. One is that the corporation, which continues to be an engine of growth, continues to be necessary, continues to produce wealthy individuals. One, it has gone global, which means that um, it is often able to escape, um, not only capture regulators, but also escape regulators by crossing national lines. And then that poses a challenge to democracy. The second thing is, is that we've seen not directly through corporations, more through um, a combination of wealthy individuals and corporations, an attempt not only at regulatory capture, but at cultural capture, in which we've seen um, in the United States with the um, allowance of, uh, by the Supreme Court of not only corporations donating to politics, but of anonymous unlimited donations through so-called social welfare organizations, etc. We see in the United States a strong effort to influence um, local elections, to influence um, the law through such things as the Federalist Society, to um, lobby um, academia, to try to pressure academia to uh, be more conservative. There is a kind of a full court press, culturally speaking, which is creating pockets, as the New York Times recently um, reported, of total party dominance by one party or the other. And that is not good for anyone. And over the long reach of history, is that going to right itself? Is this a self-equilibrating Well, this is force? the problem, is that, I, you know, again, the reason the United States, it's, it, speaking specifically about the United States, has bounced back from extremes of, of um, inequality, um, and ha because it has a robust democracy, because there have been strong centers of criticism for the sort of dominant economic and, and political and cultural forces. And if we start to weaken those centers of, of criticism, the unions, for example, yes, they lobby specifically for the economic advantage of their own members, but they also are sources of financing and of speech that criticizes the agenda of certain corporations. Now, that's not, again, I'm not criticizing corporations as across the board and saying they're bad. I'm saying we need competing voices in the culture. And so right now what worries me is that we see mainly through politics and political efforts, um, you know, very strong full court press, which is very concentrated in certain regions especially, and that's not good for American democracy. So, so Anthony mentioned $5.5 billion of corporate lobbying. Mm -hmm. What's the figure for other groups in the United States? Well, I'm not sure about that. I, you know, I, I couldn't give you the current statistics, so I, I won't pretend to. But I will say that... Um, uh, again, it's not simply a matter of, say, spending. You mentioned spending in the last election. You're right, um, you know, Mitt Romney failed with a, a minority of, of the vote, not simply uh, losing to a plurality, but to an actual majority. But what do we see? The House of Representatives, through gerrymandering, which has been a devoted campaign by conservative groups to take control of um, state legislatures, by um, really pushing hard for these lower level elections. And American democracy is very much controlled from the state level. 
in many ways. So I, I'm really not gerrymandering. I think for people that are not from the United States. Oh, gerrymandering. Yeah, this is very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Gerrymandering is an old American term um, uh, that goes back to a Massachusetts governor named Elbridge Gerry, and uh, the state legislature designed a district that included a majority of his constituents, those who supported him. And they said it looked like a salamander, so they called it a gerrymander. And so now, through computerized technology, um, American electoral districts, especially um, you know, the House of Representatives, one of our houses of Congress, and state legislatures, are now these elaborately, bizarrely drawn districts, in, oops, excuse me, in order to allow one party or another to control the legislatures. Both parties do it, but in the last presidential election, national election, the House of Representatives, the GOP actually got a minority of the popular vote, but they have a large majority of the House seats. So this is the kind of thing, when you, it goes down to the, uh, the local school board and local level, and you know, this, is, this is what's corrosive to democracy. Um, you know, this attempt to sort of, uh, as we say in the United States, to uh, um, work the ref, to try to get the referee to go to your side, pressuring the media, pressuring academia, um, trying to suppress unions, trying to control the vote through uh, voter ID laws. And I think we need a robust, robust debate, and that's the, the threat, is that political money is flowing into um, more areas than simply um, promoting speech. It's actually trying to dominate the cultural landscape and the, uh, the political landscape down to a very granular level. Thank you. Who, who thinks that's not a concern? Who's, who's less concerned with TJ's picture of a narrowing spectrum? Is I guess I, I won. I, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to, I'll come back to you. Um, let me come then to Joe Stiglitz. You know, have Americans lost their government? Have they lost it to special interests? This is, you know, the world looks to America to be government of the people, by the people, for the people. Yeah, have they uh, lost it? Yeah, uh, to some extent, I, I wrote a, a, an article that got a lot of attention that was called, it was a, uh, this was a line of government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's a line out of a very famous speech by uh, President Lincoln in the middle of the war between the states uh, rallying the troops. And the title of my article was Government of the 1% for the 1% and by the 1%. And it was reflecting the fact that uh, economic inequality can easily lead to political inequality. And just like economic, you know, the extent to which economic forces get translated into uh, economic inequality depends on the rules of the game. The extent to which economic inequality gets translated into political inequality depend on the rules of the game. And the rules of the game, unfortunately, are set by, to some extent, existing power. So the system uh, can be one which basically results in the kind of, of uh, underrepresentation of some groups and overrepresentation in terms of influence of other groups. And this is really, when, you're, when, you, when you laid out the elements of, of what you called uh, representative democracy, I, you say, you know, are we losing it? On all four of those categories, I was going to say yes, 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 and yes, we are losing it. Uh, give us but, an example. Uh, I was going to begin with the, the, the most important one that all of us would talk about is representation. The, are all the voices being heard? Can everybody vote? Now, in the United States, uh, we've had a history of an attempts at disenfranchisement. You know, of, for instance, not allowing people who are unemployed to work. It might sound strange, but uh, there have been histories of that. You mean to vote? Of, of, of trying to disallow them the right to vote. The most recent initiatives in the United States are very much making it more difficult for people who are from certain parts of the, more likely to vote Democratic to vote. And so there have been really concerted efforts at what I would call disenfranchisement. But there's a broader sense, um, which is not, you might say, legal, but by making feel, people feel that government is not representative, they say, why vote? 
So one of the interesting things, you know, we talk about, you know, pride in American democracy. In the last, uh, in the in the in the last congressional election, the 2010 election, the percentage of young people, young people, you would think are the people who have most at stake in making sure that our society works well. After all, people in the 70s don't have that much longer to live, but people uh, in, in, in their 20s have a, long, you know, have a lot at stake. Only 20% of them voted. And overall, the percentage of the voting turnout in the United States is very low. And it's not only low, it's uh, not randomly low. The poor people don't vote and there's a concerted effort to make it more difficult for them to vote. Now, so one of the proposals that I think, you know, and a lot of the money, we talk about money, goes to making sure that your supporters turn out to vote and the other guys don't. So that's where a lot of the money goes. So one of the interesting reforms, the rules of the game that I think uh, could make a difference uh, is the Australia system where you're required to vote. Now, not everybody, even if you vote, uh, does vote, but their voter turnout is over 90%. And when you go to the poll, once you are at the poll, you're more likely to vote for what you, for, for what's in, you know, you're concerned with. It still is a problem of capture, of media capture, of distorted people views, selling bad ideas. So, so it, I don't want to say that that levels the playing field, and that was the fourth question you asked in terms of, you know, access to information, access but that by itself is an important reform. Do you, do you all think that's a good idea, compulsory voting? How does that strike you? And you have to vote. Yeah, you're, 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 you have to vote. So how many of you live in a country where you do have to vote? Okay, so, so do any of you hate being forced to vote or dislike it? That's all right for all of you. Okay, what about the rest of you? So how do you it. how do you think what do you think about compulsory voting? Is there anyone that thinks that actually no, you should have the freedom to choose whether you vote or not? Yes, so tell us. Yeah. I think if we take the average public company, about seventy five percent of the shareholders vote. Mm -hmm. The others are happy with the administration. Mm -hmm. It doesn't strike me that it's necessary to go to vote for democracy to work. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are generally happy. And I think further political agitation may not increase the pleasure and, mm -hmm. and well-being of society. Thank you. And can, you're can from... I just, oh, can I just make one yes. more comment about that? But if you look at the satisfaction with the public process in the United States, the, the, the view of how well Congress is doing is about 8%, I think, is what the... the, the you know, maybe 6%. it's 10%, but it's, it's really not reflecting... A, the reason they're not voting is they're saying... Oh, what a wonderful group of congressmen we've elected. <laughs> John, but, you John know, McCain says that they're down to uh, paid staff and family members as a form of approval. <laughs> but, you know, I, think, the, I think he's lost some of his family members, I think. <laughs> I just want to take one more comment from the audience. Who, who else had a comment on compulsory voting? Yes. Follow up on uh, Dr. Stiglitz's comment in that although 8% are, uh, have, are dissatisfied with Congress, I think 80% are satisfied with their own Congress people, and, and that's why the same people keep getting reelected to Congress. Right. So they, and there's, so they, there's they also so a sense of futility. Tricky things, aren't they? Well, there's DJ. a sense of futility both. I mean, there's, um, you know, uh, shareholders in the United States are not known for particularly having a lot of influence in the way corporations are managed. Certainly, most Americans feel as if they, they have very little voice in the way the government's run. No, you know, that's... Um, it doesn't have to be so, but that's sort of a general perception, I think. Great. Ken, what do you, what do you think? Is, is rising inequality rotting the heart of American <clears throat> politics? <laughs> well, I don't think there's any doubt that globalization and technology are the driving forces b behind why inequality is rising. You're seeing it all over the world. And I think that's something that governments are going to have to adjust to, societies are going to have to adjust to. I, I personally believe, and probably I think it's probably true for the stability of the system, uh, government policy should mitigate the effects of this big change that technology and globalization is achieving and not exacerbate them. And I, I, I think, you know, there, there, there's a broad range of issues we could look at, but I'd particularly focus not at the 1%, but the 0.01%.
uh, where um, you know huge pools of wealth are passed across generations with basically no taxation. The average tax rate paid is much lower than if you just move a little bit further uh, down. And it's, it's hard to believe that, you know, that doesn't have something to do with political influence. Um, and I, I, a great believer in innovation and entrepreneurship, it is very hard to believe that you need quite the extremes that we have. Uh, I, I, I can well imagine if things go on their current course as they might, uh, Davos will soon be feasting the first $200 billion man or woman, and maybe even in my lifetime, if there's a little bit of inflation too, we'll see the first trillion dollar man or woman. And I, I just, you know, I, I, I think it's uh, corrosive. Um, I, I think it's not just about income, it's also about education many other things uh, associated around that. But I, I, I have to say that I surveyed the political economy literature. I talked to my political science friends, and m maybe some of you are, are there. And of course, it's actually quite complicated to prove that, what I just said. Mm -hmm. It's very nuanced. They're both sides. But anyway, I, it's, it, it's hard to believe that we would see these very low tax rates on the ultra-wealthy without some feedback through the political system. And but can you just tell us why you think that not that permitting the 0.1% to pay so little tax corrodes democracy? Oh, I think it's happening because uh, they have power and political power and it's reinforcing. And so, of course, the worst thing, I think the single most important thing in the United States is a sense that there's social mobility, a sense that, you know, after a couple of generations, everyone has a chance. And there's just, you know, a lot of concern that's not as much the case anymore. Mm -hmm. So so what would the solution to that be? Do you think just... Well, I, you know, I, I, it's not uh, simple, but I mean, I think for sure, uh, you know, having a different tax system, I might scrap ours entirely if I had a choice. And I think even having a flat tax with a very high deductible and maybe some negative transfer, you know, for the very low income would actually be a lot more egalitarian effectively than the one we have. Uh, education is just incredibly important. That's a big piece of where the inequality is passed from one generation uh, to another. And I mean, I, I would absolutely say broaden education to say in all forms. My mother was a librarian and she used to complain that the state legislature didn't understand that adults need education too. And we live in a world where people may need to change jobs seven times and having various forms, not just traditional ones, but new media and, and, and such is important. So those who, globalization technologies creating massive inequality, that's what government should mitigate and those benefiting the most from it should be helping governments to mitigate. At the very least, it shouldn't be exacerbating yeah. the situation, which is I think what I would say is the case. And, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, to me, I mean, it's, it's not so simple, but my take is that if we're getting this sweeping change, which is by and large a good thing for the world, that the governments need to take steps to try to mitigate its effects. And I don't think this is a one-year or two-year thing. I don't need to tell this group that. This is likely to go on for decades. So we're drawing out of this debate some possible ways forward, in other words, ways that democracy in a way might defend itself. Joe's put to us that everybody voting is really important. One way forward on that is compulsory voting. There, there are many other ways that we could think about taking that forward. Ken is putting to us that you've got to have governments that can mitigate the effects of inequality, and he's pointing to taxation as a way forward. Anthony, you've talked about the positive role that corporations can play the, 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 and wealthy individuals. In, in fostering a well-informed debate, but you have sort of conceded that sometimes they're overdoing it and they're, they're being too narrow in their interests. What's the, what's the solution to that? Is it to get corporations to vow that they will stop doing that? Is it to ban them from certain parts of the regulatory process? What, what to you is the way, not to constrain yourself, but to constrain those corporate actors that you think are really pushing it too far? Well, Again, my personal opinion, but there's a symbiosis between the corporation and the elected official. Mm -hmm. 
And so down deep, they're sort of playing each other and they're giving each other what they want. And so at some point, it's about political leadership more than anything else, mm -hmm. where we get some transcendental political leaders that will step forward and put the interests of the people ahead of that sort of reelection uh, process and that cycle. Um, and so the three things that I've always tried to champion is one is equality, which is why I'm a big supporter of the, you know, the liberal, the civil rights cause for gays and lesbians. Two is the educational process that both professors are talking about. I'm the product of a uh, public school education and a blue collar family. Neither of my parents went to college, and yet I've experienced the social mobility of the American dream because of their push and their sacrifice. If we can get more corporations to think like that, um, to promote equality and diversity in their employment base, but to also help children in areas of the United States where, frankly, they can't get a good education. You know, Secretary Rice once said in a public speech, if you tell me the zip code of the child in the United States, I can tell you whether or not that child can get a good public school education. I think that's where the unfairness begins, and I think corporations have a social responsibility. Uh, one presidential candidate said that corporations were people, too. I don't know if anybody remembers that remark. But if they are people, of course I don't think they are, but if they are, they have a social responsibility and they need to have more of a social conscience to promote this sort of egalitarianism. But, but is it right that hedge funds can pump billions into political campaigns? Can they buy their favorite candidates? Or should there be limits on that? Well, you know, un unfortunately, there aren't limits on that. If you're asking my personal opinion, um, I think there should be limits on that. But what I've learned about the real world is I don't live in a normative world. I live in a world of is, not the world of ought. And so I have to deal with the world the way it is. And so what I look for in people is real leadership. And real leadership requires not thinking about yourself, but thinking about the other people around you and recognizing that together and creating more social cohesion, we can have a better society. And so you're right. There are people that are doing exactly what you're saying. They're lobbying. They're pumping billions into certain ideas that promote their own self-interest. But I do believe, and I just wrote an op-ed about this, I do believe that the message in the United States, the people are ready for candidates that are going to tell them the truth, where they have this aha moment. That person's telling me the truth. I'm going to be able to vote for somebody that has a plan where I actually really believe what they're saying. And I think that will be the transformative moment. I'm a very big optimist on America. And I think that we have a tendency to re-engineer ourselves. And I think we're on that path. Mm -hmm. Can I just make, make a couple of observations? You know, a study that just came, reported in the, in, the Her uh, in the New York Times today, I don't know if you saw it, uh, that uh, on how, low, how badly the United States is doing in economic mobility that we are much lower than Denmark, much lower than, uh, than other countries, and much lower than we think of ourselves, that there really isn't this land of equal opportunity. Uh, you know, and there's been a lot, of, this is just another study collaborating, uh, a whole set of studies that have been uh, going on. Um, the second thing I wanted to uh, comment is, it's not just in the elections and in the campaign contributions, which are one of the things it's in the whole way our government operates, so that, for instance, when we uh, go through the regulatory process, uh, there are rules about how you make regulations, you have comment periods, the people have to respond, the government has to respond. Well, they're very technical, and the m most, of res uh, most of the responses come from uh, the corporate interest. And the regulations, now, there are the regulations about the regulatory process say that the government has to respond to all the regulations. But that means that if you underfund the regulatory body, they can't engage in really fair regulation. So we've created a regulatory structure, which again builds in inequality. But, but Joe, how do you get around that? I mean, you need regulators with expertise, and they usually get expertise by working in the sector. You need comment on regulation that is expert. There aren't that many people um, in communities that have, you know, specific views on each portion of Dodd-Frank. Um, so, so how do you get the expertise but without getting the capture? Well, uh, now you're what's, getting what's the close solution? to something that is, is 
almost in my own self-interest, I think in academia you do have uh, <laughs> a, a lot of people who have expertise who are not quite so much of a vested interest. I think the problem is a real problem, and I think, you know, I, I want to reflect, you know, there's no perfect solutions here, but I think what we're saying is we've lost a certain amount of balance and we not need to tweak the thing to try to restore balance. So, for instance, on this issue of regulatory comment, the uh, you need to, uh, if you're going to have that process, and it's understandable why you want that process, you have to fund the government agencies that are doing the regulations better. And you have to pay the regulators better so that you can get qualified people who can write you know, good answers to the regulations on different sides. The second thing, really picking up what was said uh, before, you need to fund, as a matter of public interest, public interest groups. So there needs to, it might sound strange, but the government needs to fund public interest groups so to create the checks and balances. The inequality in our society has gotten to the point where, you know, and the unions have gotten weak enough, uh, we don't have a equality in think tanks. Uh, there's more money going to think tanks on one side than the other. Ken, you were going to speak on that on that point, or well, it, well, I, I, I let, let me first pick up on the general issue of regulation. I mean, another I think very important element of inequality in the United States people don't often think about comes when you look at statistics on obesity. Uh, of course, you know there there are people who don't have enough to eat, but by far the larger problem between the the, the lower middle class and say the upper middle class is uh, diet and education about diet. It's a, a, a staggering problem. Uh, the, we, we think at this group, when people are talking about lobbying, they're thinking about big finance, but big food lobbies in this regulatory process for a lot of processed foods and the way advertising is done for children. And this isn't a little thing. This is affecting their quality of life for their whole life. This is affecting life expectancy. Our healthcare system. Well, it, it, I, it, and well, you know, I, I, w I was going to come back to balance this by saying, you know, um, I think it's also true that sometimes it's hard to measure inequality of consumption. It's a little harder because I think medical care is an example where there are innovations that come that the very wealthy have access to. But those innovations get passed through at very low prices 10 years later, and there are many, 15 years later, there are many examples of that, particularly with, uh, with drugs, but many other things. I, I think this is an example where that's not true, that there, there are life, uh, lifetime effects. And, and then I did want to pick up on the, pu the public education. I mean, to me, this is just a frightening aspect of our society that we don't have ways to fund information for the public. There are many people from the media here keenly aware of how, you know, the whole process is broken down. Uh, and I, I see very, uh, very important role for having the government provide public education. You know, we see it in certain ways through public radio, public television, but there, one can imagine as we talk about the Internet, uh, other things. There's a lot of opposition to that. And it's very political that, you know, just politically uh, we don't want it. And I think that's a a very important thing to overcome and so that when people are forced to vote and get their ballots, they have somewhere to turn uh, to look for to how to inform them at least of what the issues are, well, not I, necessarily I, how they should vote. I, and I want to pick up on that. We're just kind of rotating around. Um, that uh, it's, it's exactly the problem, first of all, of, you know, we, we have insufficient funding, even a suspicion in, lar in many quarters of some of the sources of criticism that stand outside of, of economic interests. You know, public media, for example, uh, public interest groups, um, academia, which sometimes the funding is threatened because they're seen the, there's a criticism from the right that there's too many left-wing professors, so we don't want to give a lot of money to public universities. Um, there is, you know, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party have both have their strengths and weaknesses, but we, we see currently, again, partially or largely due to gerrymandering and a very ardent um, ideological campaign by well-funded groups. Now, in you see, especially in the Republican Party at the moment, not through any special lack of virtue, but through the structure of politics, you see that the debate is who is more extreme than the next person. 
So, you know, basic things that Americans have always accepted as a basic responsibility of government, um, such as public education, which is a very old tradition in the United States. Now that has come under great attack. And where a lot of people say the, the uh, solution to um, solving the problem in, in public education is to, uh, you know, blame the poor and defund schools, or at least certain schools, as if somehow those schools will then get better with less money. Um, that's the kind of ideological fervor which is exacerbating the problem. And but TJ, part of so part of what you were saying earlier is that we need a marketplace of ideas. Yes, that's right? true. Yeah. So you can have extreme ideas so long as you've got a big marketplace where these ideas play out. But there there has to be fair competition, and and the problem is is that um, if you have Representative X um, and he his main concern in a narrowly gerrymandered district, he, there is no competitive politics except for with the most extreme version. In the United States, there's this term called being primaried, where a more ideological um, candidate will, will uh, challenge you in a primary election before the general election if you do not hew to the most ideologically pure line. And, and, and so I this just, creates a, a push toward the margin. And nobody votes in primary elections. If it's yeah, exactly. The, That's exactly it. It's so, only the most ideologically motivated. So what, and what's the solution to that, then? What's the solution to this very narrow kind of just win the election and everything follows from that. Well, one solution is nonpartisan redistricting in the United States, mm -hmm. where um, the uh, you know the, I think that's it's a very important idea where the um, the district is not drawn on political lines; it's drawn on on other factors by nonpartisan panel. Um, you know, no solution is perfect. We kind of we kind of you know find our way forward. Mm -hmm. And I should say, you know, no regulation is perfect either. In in the 19th century, for example, um, you know, when I get my own regulatory urges start going, I remind myself, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who did commit some things that, some economic acts that helped spark the modern debate over regulating the corporation. For example, in 1867, he, uh, um, in a dispute with the connecting railroad, he cut off all rail traffic into New York City during a blizzard in which no shipping could reach Manhattan's docks. I knew there was a precedent for that. Yes. <laughs> but that's exactly it. You can see the outcry over one bridge being blocked. Imagine the entire city being cut off by one person's decision who isn't even an elected official. Um, and it, needless to say, it helped start the modern debate over regulating you know, these private disputes within private interests when they affect the public interest. But, it's, now, it's, it's, but on the other side... He was criticized fiercely by the intellectuals of the day for carrying out a stock split. Very equitably, there was, today there would be nothing considered wrong about it by anyone. But at the time, there was an entirely, to us, alien theory of the basis of stock value, that it, if you did not actually build more physical facilities, you could not issue more stock. And so it was fraud. And so just a generation later, what he did would have been perfectly fine. But at the time, there were cries for regulation of this to put a stop to it. So my point is, is that we can't always, you know, we have to have regulations. We have to have oversight. We are going to get it wrong. It's, it, the, you know, the corporation and wealthy interests, they are very important interests in our society. They have to play a role in this debate. The thing is, is that society has to make sure that because of their financing, because of their natural influence, because of this, the symbiosis you talked about, um, you know, where, where if you are the head of a large corporation, you get heard, you get to go into a meeting with a, a governor, with a, um, a congressman, with a, a you know, a, a senator, and she'll, she'll meet with you. And that's, you know, that's to be expected. We have to, though, encourage the competing voices. And, you know, we'll get it wrong, but we have to keep the debate going. We have to keep the debate robust. So you're telling us, on the one hand, this, some of this has always been happening. Some of this is politics as normal, but... We're seeing a sharpening of it at the moment, yes. which means we, we do have to do something. So the panelists have put to you a bunch of ideas of how, as it were, democracy needs to defend itself in the United States. They've said a much fairer drawing of electoral boundaries, public broadcasting and public education funding, uh, fairer taxation, compulsory voting, limits on campaign donations, perhaps, um, a different kind of political leadership. 
Which ones strike you as important? Or is there one that they've been missing that strikes you as an important step? Yes. Um, I, I do introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Stephanie Stewart. Um, I do a lot of work for the Democratic Party, so I am partisan. Um, I live in the UK. I'm a dual citizen and national. I vote in both countries. And I can see a huge difference in the way the two countries operate in terms of money. And I was just wondering how you guys feel about Citizens United and what it's doing. Because in the UK, of course, we have limits and, and we only campaign for a few months, thank God. And, you know, there are lots of things that are very corrosive in that Citizens United decision, in my opinion, and I'm wondering what you think about that. Can I, can I just say a very brief historical note on Citizens United? You know, the, the 19th century is when the, the corporation, those of you who have committed to heart um, wealth of nations, know that Adam Smith condemned corporations as a species of monopoly because the corporation was invented as a mercantilist device to carve out pieces of the economy to essentially reward uh, members of the, uh, the, the landed elite for putting resources into what were seen by uh, lawmakers as publicly useful entities. The United States, Cornelius Vanderbilt and others helped break down that idea and turn the corporation into a, a business enterprise. But everyone had the idea for, for much of the 19th century that the corporation served a public purpose, that it was this artificial creation the idea that it is itself a citizen that can influence elections was wholly alien for much of our history. Thank it you. is that, created by law. That's great, but I want to, now I want to take some more comments from the audience. Are there ideas, those of you who are not American in the audience, are there ideas that you can share with our American colleagues about things that are protecting democracy in your countries? Or, or do you have views on the ideas that have been suggested? Yes. Do introduce yourself. Arjun Thaban from India. Um, I come from part of the world where 4% of the country pays income tax. And a disparity between um, rich and poor is dramatic. Um, I actually do believe that democracy actually looks after itself. Um, where a significant amount of anger, pain, frustration leads to what we've recently seen as voter turnouts in the excesses of 75%, which have led to legislatures in certain states actually being... Um, dramatically skewed in, 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 in particular directions. That's also led to urban centers um, where there has been that frustration that, that does grow. So um, really, um, if you actually have uh, in our country um, a difference where 15 to 20 million people for the next 20 years are going to enter the workforce every year, and you don't create the kind of jobs that are necessary to, um, to <clears throat> make those people happy, uh, political change is inevitable. Um, it's not something that can be controlled by a, by a handful of people through some of the things you're, that you're describing. So, I, so you, your point is that you'll have a revolution unless you... Ba basically, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Unless, I, I think, you, do unless you do what? Unless you do what? reformation, maybe not a revolution. I mean, I, I, think, I think the, 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 the uh, part of the context is what are we talking about? Are we talking about short term, medium term? I mean, if we're talking about two election cycles, I mean, okay, what's the big deal? I think you, you have to wait for people to get... Mm -hmm pissed off enough to excuse, excuse the French before they start to basically vote with their feet, regardless of how you draw up the constituencies. But, but you're saying that creating jobs is a precursor to doing any kind of democratic well, it's, it's, it's one of the things. It's one of the many things. Um, I mean, there's a lot of issues in India that, that go beyond the creation of just mm -hmm. jobs, but, you know, that's, that's a big deal today. Mm -hmm. And it's going to become a very big deal for the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. can I, can I so, so, the, so we've got two points uh, that, are, that the audience are putting to us. One is the Citizens United case, you know, what happened. Um, the second is, and I think it's a really important point, to protect democracy, do you work on jobs and inequality or do you work on democratic processes? Which way would you go? Which, which one of those two would you work on first? Joe, you wanted to respond. Well, well, first, I, I want to say, say about Citizens United, uh, it wasn't actually the worst of the ways by which money, the super PACs, and one of the attempts that one of the stakes made to, to level the playing field was to say that if one candidate raised a lot more money than the other, then the state would try to offset that differential by trying to create a more level playing field. And the US Supreme Court, this was in Arizona, declared that was unconstitutional. 
that it, well, you had a constitutional right to inequality in voice. I thought that was totally uh, undermining what I view is, as uh, a democratic processes. So in the United States, we have constitutional constraints that really are undermining our democracy. On this issue of, of one of the points I think you were making was that there's a self-correcting process over the longer run. And I guess I'm looking at this a little bit from maybe a jaundice of American perspective, and this may be an extreme. The South of the United States officially had democracy, but we were success, we, they were successfully, successfully disenfranchised, disempowered the African Americans so that it was only as a result of intervention from the rest of the country that democracy was restored in the South of the United States. Now, you can have the same thing, and I see the same kind of pattern going on in other countries around the world. When you have enough inequality, the people who have, you know, you can buy votes. You can, you can, persu you can persuade people that uh, accept this little pittance, and you'll be better off, and meanwhile, let me keep the, the, the big pie. An example of that goes back really to what Ken was talking about, the sale of the, the persuasion of most Americans that low capital gains tax rates are good for them when you know 90% of the value of that capital preferential treatment of capital gains goes to the very top. So most Americans, you know, or a large fraction of Americans actually supported this peculiar provision but including step up a basis and a whole set of other technical details. The real point is that if you don't have good access to information, you can sell bad ideas just like you can sell poisonous cigarettes and uh, products that lead to obesity. Ken, you were going to comment as well. well I, I just, since we're bringing in the rest of the world, I just want to say that it's absolutely correct that the U.S. will fix itself eventually, and there will be forces pushing back. But, you know, I do think timing does matter a little bit here. The dysfunction that we've seen in the United States, the shutdown, threat of default, the sequester, uh, is absolutely a reflection of fighting over some of these exact issues. And there isn't a clear end in sight. I mean, there's some optimists saying, well, it won't happen again. I'm not so sure. And, uh, you know, so there, the, the rest of the world, aside from hoping the United States, you know, can grow, this dysfunction uh, has been visited on you already, and it could get worse. Here, here. Um, other comments from the audience? Yes, down here. Do, do introduce yourself, and here's a microphone. Hi, my name's Dr. Annie Sparrow. I'm from Perth. I'm married in New Yorker. And the issue of mandatory voting... That's what we do, and we, we agree with it, we do it, we get penalised if we don't do it. And coming to America, you know, we look, at, we look at Americans and we think that's not democracy, that's like a collective act of delusion when only some of you have to vote and you can get actively written out of the voting system, as is done all the time. So when we have our government elected and, and we, we think it sucks, at least we know that it's a, you know, democr democratically sucks, whether it's daylight <laughs> saving or our, or our governor or our prime minister, and it goes a very, very long way towards uh, implementing a lot of the other processes mm -hmm. that we think. I mean, it's, 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 it's very odd to have this discussion situated well above what most of us or so many of us from the rest of the world would consider a baseline mm -hmm. issue of mandatory voting in order to exercise that basic democratic principle. But I think this debate has taken us to something slightly different. I think actually all the panellists agree to some degree that money politics is corroding democracy and a good part of the audience. I think what they disagree about is where you begin to resolve that problem. Do you resolve that problem by really taking on inequality and trying to make citizens more economically equal to empower them to play a role in the political system? Or do you resolve it by putting new rules around the political system, 
accepting the economic inequalities, but bringing in compulsory voting, putting limits on campaign financing and such like. And I'd love to hear a couple more views on that from the audience. I'm going to come back to the panelists and then I'm going to have you vote. Yes. I wanted to, uh, my name is Anata Damati, I'm from Stanford University. I wanted to, to say a couple of things. First of all, if you read the books about DC, if you listen to, to the talk about lobbyists, it's sort of certainly part of, a lot of it is campaign financing and just, uh, you know, read this town or Republic Lost or any of that and how we can get bad policies uh, in, in this system. So certainly uh, something about campaign financing would seem to, uh, to be important. But another completely different point has to do with, uh, to the extent that corporations are part of it and, and a part of the conversation, it goes to the governance of corporations, it's themselves. And there too, uh, you have an issue of how corporations work and what shareholder value even means and who the shareholders are in this system with a lot of institutional investors involved and it's sort of a system in which the, the diversified small investor pensioner is lost in the governance of corporations as well because they're working for the the shareholder is supposed to be a shareholder entirely invested there, which ends up again being the management. So if corporations work for managers, then and then they lobby, and then we have interest groups, you get a breakdown. Great. So the there. point is make, dem make corporations more democratic, and that could be part of the solution. We've only got time for like two quick more comments. So just one, one at the back there, and then we'll come down to... Uh, hi, I'm Grenville Byford. I'm a writer about Turkish politics. But... I'd like to talk about American politics for a moment. Okay, we've just one got a one of the issues time. I'm surprised has not mm -hmm. been raised is secrecy. Mm -hmm. We now have a technology that would, in principle, enable us to know within a day who was funding political campaigns. Mm -hmm. And yet we have laws that permit people to effectively contribute large sums of money to political campaigns in complete secrecy. We have no way of knowing what bias they have and correcting the views they, they put forward based on that knowledge. Thank you. Does anyone think that you should have a right to give anonymously? No. Last comment, just um, down here. Yeah, Michael Stewart, I'm CEO of Europe for Edelman. I just wanted to address the question you raised. I think it's an important one there. Um, I don't think it's an either or. I think transformational economic development and job creation is going to take a long period of time. I think while that is playing out, there are fundamental changes that can be made to the political processes that support democracy that can both enable the longer term economic transformation, but get to empowerment of, of, of robust democracy. So I think as many things in life, it's both. Thank you. Now, what I'd like you to do now is, is to have a final vote, which is, can democracy defend itself? So at least 64% of you, perhaps more, thought that money politics is corroding democracy in some way. Some of you might have been persuaded that it was corroding democracy even if you didn't begin with that view. But we've had a discussion that's presented you with lots of ideas about how democracy can defend itself. So I'd like you to vote on whether you think democracy can or actually whether we're headed down a path which will continue, as I set out at the beginning, to corrode or weaken the representativeness of democracy, the fairness of judges and courts, the plurality of different interest groups, the open and fair commentary, the transparency, as, as others have focused on, of government. So what do you think? I think, actually, we've got the question is, can democracy defend itself? But it's slightly more, will democracy <laughs> defend itself? It's what we're really asking you to vote on. So let's just have a look before we close at what you think. Short term for the financial services sector, 11 seconds, or short term for the... <laughs> well, there's a, there's a very optimistic view. Democracy can defend itself. We should have asked you, will democracy defend itself? But I'm sure it's got lots of defenders in this room. Can you join me in thanking our panellists for giving us such a rich debate? Thank you. Thank you.